Hello, everyone. I wanted to show you a couple of these slides before we get into the space program. Here's a slide of the moon showing asteroid impacts from larger asteroid impacts from 2005 to 2008. Notice where they are. They're not uniform on the whole moon. Most of them are over here. There are some over here. And why do you think most of them would be over here? So these are just, they're just no, numbered here. Why? Think about the moon's motion. The moon's motion around through space, around the Earth, orbiting the Earth. It's always going around this way. So it's kind of like this. When you're driving in the rain uh, on the freeway, and don't you notice that your windshield is getting wet or pounded more than your, your back window? You're, you're hitting more because of your motion. Well, the moon's going to be sweeping through space in this direction, so more objects are going to hit it. And some are going to hit the other side, but why wouldn't they not hit here? I don't see many, many that are here. Well, isn't it true that in order to get here, what would you have to go through or get, you know, go near if you're an asteroid or a meteoroid? Or, wouldn't you have to head toward, isn't the Earth in the way? So in order to get here from somewhere else, you'd have to go in the direction of the Earth. You'd have to pass the Earth. So the Earth probably is blocking a lot of these from hitting. So that's this slide. I thought it was an interesting slide. Look at this slide. Now, remember the moon is in is an elliptical orbit around, around the Earth. So there are, for this elliptical orbit, there sometimes it is a close point to the Earth, which would be called perigee. And sometimes the moon is farthest, farther from the Earth. At a far point, it's called apogee. So the moon will look bigger when it's closer, of course. And it's about 221,000 miles at its closest and about 252,000 miles at its furthest. So when it's closest, when it's near perigee and it happens to be full, it's going to be much bigger apparently than when it's near apogee and it's full. And it is called a supermoon. You may have heard of that. When it's close to perigee and it's close to, pretty close to full moon, it's called a supermoon. So whenever you hear them talking about the supermoon, it means it's probably pretty close to full moon and it's very close to perigee. So it's going to look something like 17% bigger in the sky. It's a little bigger. It'll look bigger. However, it won't really look that much bigger to you necessarily or to people because in order to see how much bigger it looks than a normal size full moon, or that's not normal, but this is when it looks small, you'd have to have another moon to compare it to. And guess what? When you have one moon in the sky, when you have our, you know, the moon in the sky, you don't have another one to say, oh, look, it is bigger than when it's at Apogee. No, you don't have that luxury. So it might look bigger to you, but without anything to compare it to, you may not even notice. So now, I'm gonna stop share here. We are going to talk about the space program. So let's get this going. And ooh, I didn't, uh, I gotta go back, sorry. And I didn't share here, so let me share. So I'm gonna share screen. All right, Oops, keep going to that. The space program. Well, the space program is a, our humans' goal or missions to get into space. And before the space program, before we started like thinking about getting into space, well, there's a reason we thought about getting to space, and it was this. After World War II, uh, especially the Russians and the US, there was this, this Cold War time where people were worried about another war. And it was thought that whoever controls space will be like controlling Earth. Of course, if you're in space and you can maybe spy on people or have weapons in space, you're going to have a advantage if there's a war. So there was the goal. So it started, so the space program pretty much started in kind of a military way, just to kind of, for control. And it started pretty much with the Russians and, and the U.S., because those are the two like powers at the time. And so there was this goal to get into space, to get a, a spacecraft into space, and then maybe eventually animals into space, to, and then eventually maybe people into space. And 
and they may, maybe people to the moon to, to kind of show the dominance of a country to get to the moon. So this time was in uh, the, well, the 40s and 50s. So we were mainly in, in competition with the Russians. So we were gonna, we wanted to beat them. We wanted to beat them badly into space. But guess what? We didn't. We did not beat them into space because they sent up in 1957, Sputnik. It was the first artificial satellite. And that was, that's good to know. I mean, so they beat us into space with a satellite. We were not happy about it. We were not happy about it at all. So we wanted to uh, maybe, I mean, we wanted to at least catch up to them. And here's the launch of Sputnik. By the way, Spud Webb, uh, the basketball player, maybe you've heard of him, maybe you haven't, only five foot, uh, he's listed at 5'7", but I think it was really 5'5 five, five and a half. We won a dunking contest in the 80s. Well, what I heard is that uh, his grandmother named him uh, Spud, and it was after Sputnik. And I don't know if that's true, but I thought that was an interesting story. Well, there's the launch. Now, okay, the Russians beat us with a satellite. Maybe we can get an animal up there, at least to get, you know, to, to, to advance before, uh, before the Russians do. But guess what? Laika was sent up before, before we got an animal up there. And she was the first animal to orbit the Earth. And that was in Sputnik 2. They call that Sputnik 2. That was also in 1957. And about a month later, after uh, the first Sputnik. So they beat us with an animal, and we were not happy about it at all. We actually called Sputnik 2 Mutnik, just to kind of insult this mission. And here was the, the uh, capsule, or a model of the capsule Laika was in. And so there's like, I was intrigued by Laika when, uh, because we, of course we're gonna send animals up before we send humans. We always test on animals. I mean, that's what we do here, unfortunately. I, I really, yeah, if, if I mean, I am really against that, testing on animals. I always buy products that uh, do not test on animals. But well, of course, if, we're gonna, if it's something dangerous, we're gonna send an animal to do it first. And that's just what we do. And uh, I don't agree with it, but uh, that's, what, you know, that's what we do. But I was intrigued with Laika when I was a kid and just by the story of Laika going up there. And here's Laika's capsule, their model of it. Laika would be here. Down at the down at the, bo the bottom, the very this is the very top of the capsule. Now look, here's the launch. The Leica, uh, the rocket before launch, Leica would be way up here. And there were these stamps. I used to collect stamps, and I remember getting Leica stamps. And I was really you know really intrigued by Leica. And I just I don't know what happened to those stamps. So some years ago, I just went on eBay and got for spent a few bucks and got another Leica stamp. I wish I could show you, but it's at the school. Uh, but here, it turns out this. Now, there was, I remember reading something, I don't have it right with me right now, but one of their scientists, here's what happened. Uh, they weren't planning on bringing Leica back. So they were gonna have Leica orbit something like seven times, and then the capsule that she was in was gonna come down, back down into uh, Earth's atmosphere and burn up. That was the plan. And there was a scientist, uh, I think his name was Oleg Gazenko. He said that uh, he really regrets this mission. He, they didn't learn enough in this mission to have, to have um, justified the death of Laika. So he had said this some years ago, a while ago, and it just came out within the last 10 years. It turns out Laika, she didn't even survive to make it into orbit. I mean, she, was, she had died on launch. They don't know why. They, they thought that she may, um, I don't know, uh, may have had a heart attack. Maybe the, maybe the G-force was too great but she didn't even make it. So this was leaked out by the Russians. So this guy, Oleg Gazenko, who said, you know, you, he, about this stuff, well, that was true. What do you, I mean, yeah, but that's not even the right story. So he wasn't really telling the truth either because they didn't men he didn't mention that Laika died on the way up. So now we know Laika died. She did orbit. She was the first animal to orbit Earth, but she was not alive then uh, as she was, or uh, she was orbiting, which is unfortunate. So uh, we do, I mean, we've sent, anim we've, we've sent animals up. The Russians sent also other animals up. We sent, um, you know, a monkey, uh, monkeys up, chimpanzees. Now, so here's what we're going to do. We said, okay, they beat us with a satellite. They beat us with an animal. At the time, we didn't know she had died, but they still beat us with an animal, the, the Russians. We are going to beat them with a person into space. We got to get a person up there before the Russians, and then it doesn't matter. They beat us with an animal. They beat us with a 
with Sputnik 2, it doesn't matter if we get a person into space, we, we, we take, you know, we're, we're taking for first place for now. So what we did is we had these, this, these astronauts, uh, which were actually test pilots for the military. And it was called the Mercury series. Now there's a movie that I'm going to have you, well, I'll have you, I'll give you extra credit for watching it. It's called the right stuff. And I will uh, give you a, a few points extra credit if you watch it and write a paragraph about it. It's a long movie. It's over three hours. And it's about these astronauts. So here are the seven Mercury series astronauts. And one of them, they were, I mean, they, so these are, they, it was all weeded out from hundreds of, of test pilots. These are all military. And <clears throat> here they are. You might have heard of some of them. Alan Shepard, uh, Virgil Gus Grissom, John Glenn. And yeah, probably you heard of John Glenn, Scott Carpenter, Wally Schirra, uh, Gordon Hotdog Cooper, and Deke Slayton. Well, these were the astronauts, the, the real astronauts. But if you watch the movie, The Right Stuff, and you, buy, you might be able to find it on Netflix or Amazon Prime. It's, they embellish some of this. And I would have normally shown you some of this uh, if we had been in the class. And maybe I'll th find a way to show you a clip of it. Maybe I'll get a clip on here and post these. But the ones who play, I mean, if you go back to this, the, the, these are the real astronauts. But the one who plays, uh, the one who play, let me see, uh, Gus Grissom is Fred Ward. So Fred Ward, you probably know from Tremors with Kevin Bacon, right? If you ever saw Tremors. So that's Fred Ward plays Gus Grissom. John Glenn is played by Ed Harris. I mean, you know Ed Harris. If you saw Apollo 13, Ed Harris is in there. I mean, you know Ed Harris from, uh, from Planes, Fire, and Rescue. I mean, I have, I have a 10-year-old. I've, I've seen that movie like, a lot. So uh, playing, playing Blade in there. So Ed Harris, I mean, you've seen him. In, I'm, I'm sure you've seen him in other movies. And uh, uh, Scott, I'm trying to think of, oh, Scott Glenn plays Alan Shepard. I don't even know if that's Alan Shepard right, right there. But uh, Scott Glenn, I think you've seen Scott Glenn in, what have you seen him in? Uh, oh, he actually plays, if you watch um, Daredevil, this, the series on uh, Netflix, the, guy, the one who plays Blade, uh, that was Scott Glenn. And Hot Dog Cooper uh, was played uh, by Dennis, Dennis Quaid. I don't know Dennis Quaid. So you know probably some of these names. I mean, you, I think you know Dennis Quaid. So we were going to get one of these astronauts up. I mean, before. I mean, so the right stuff. I'll give you a few points if you watch this movie. It's a long one, but I think it's it's pretty interesting. Little uh, interesting history. I'll try to find some clips for you to, to post. So what happened? We were getting ready. And, oh, I got to say this. Sam Shepard. Um, it was actually he was in the movie. This actor, Sam Shepard. You might have seen him in like movies like Mud. He just died, I think, a couple years last year, a couple years ago. But he used to, you know, big. He's a was a actor, he was a writer, and he played in the movie. This uh, and he you know he played. He played Chuck Yeager. This is the real Chuck Yeager. The real Chuck Yeager. What you remember? Why he's famous? He was the first person to go faster than the speed of sound, faster than Mach one, which is the speed of sound in his, uh, this Bell X-1 spacecraft. And that's featured in this movie. And so Jaeger was talked about as maybe, this is the real Jaeger, as being the best pilot that ever lived. The best pilot. But however, in the movie, it talks about this. So Sam Shepard plays him in the movie, the best pilot who ever lived, maybe who, who uh, flew, you know, would always take on these tough missions and is as brave as, you can, as can be. And uh, they didn't cho choose him to be an astronaut though. He wasn't one of the Mercury 7. So it's kind of an interesting story in the, in the movie. And you know why they didn't choose him to be an astronaut? Because he never went to college. So maybe he was the best, maybe he would have been the best astronaut there had been, the best pilot that, that there ever was maybe. But because he didn't go to college, they didn't pick him as an astronaut. So there's a moral there, a lesson, stay in school. And uh, it's something interesting. Chuck Yeager, he's still around. He's still alive. And I think he's something like 97. And about, well, maybe, he might be 90, I mean, he's, some, he's up there now. And he was in the movie. He actually did a cameo in the movie from the 1984, and uh, he was a little older then too. So, so yeah, Chuck Yeager, still you know, the best pilot that ever lived, still around. Well, I saw him, it was like probably eh, six, seven, eight years ago, so watching a Giants game. He was at the Giants game. 
uh, I think with his, with his wife. And so he was, he's a Giants fan. So you know what? Listen to this. The best pilot who ever lived is a Giants fan. That's, I don't need to say any more. All right. Not a, well, I'll just say one more. I don't need to say it. He's not a Dodgers fan. He's a Giants fan. Something to think about. So we were getting ready to send, uh, not, not, uh, yeah, not, um, yeah, that's Sam Shepard, the actor, Ch he played Chuck Yeager. Uh, we were getting ready to send one of the astronauts up and guess what happened? The astronauts found out something they didn't like in the Mercury 7 astronauts. And we sent a chimpanzee up that were gonna pretty much into space and came back that did the same thing the astronauts would have done just like, just to go up there. Astronauts were not happy at all. I mean, to have, to be ready, preparing to go up and be, I mean, a lot of these missions were blowing up. So that's why we didn't want to send an astronaut up. I mean, if half the missions are blowing up, I mean, just the tests uh, without people, it kind of doesn't instill confidence. Imagine bringing your family out and uh, saying, hey, look at this. We're going to practice today. Here's a rocket. Uh, watch it. You know, it's going to go up there. This is what I might do in the next week. And the rocket blows up uh, as soon as it's launched. Yeah, your, your family's probably not too happy about that. So because a lot of things were blowing up, we decided, hey, let's test on an animal first. Let's send an animal up. Well, the astronauts were brave enough, or even if it were a 50% chance of blowing up, not making it, these, these guys were the like, bravest. These guys are, I mean, these were the military guys. Military guys, while I don't agree with like fight, you know, wars and all that stuff, I have to admit that these military people are probably the bravest people there are. I, I admit that. I mean, these people are risk their lives all the time. I and mean, military people, firefighters. I mean, these people uh, have my, utmost respect, um, even though, you know, I would never, I would never probably want to be in the military, but I have respect for these people. I, I, I'm not brave enough for that. But uh, yeah, the, so Ham was sent up. The first American primate into space, he didn't make a full orbit, went up, came down. Astronauts were not very happy. They wanted to be doing this. So now, we, these astronauts are getting ready to go up to beat the Russians. Oh, uh, yeah, it keeps, uh, this, uh, there's a, um, Great, great story here about uh, Katherine Johnson. These women, African-American women, were instrumental in the space program. And there's a movie called Hidden Figures. Let me show it to you. This. You see this movie? I, I, I'll give you three points. You, this is a great movie. I've seen it a couple times. And it, it's, it's true. It's all true about, uh, I, don't, it's not, I don't believe it's embellished like the right stuff. This thing, this is true. Great movie about uh, Katherine Johnson and also Mary Jackson and Dorothy Vaughn, all instrumental in the space program. And may, mostly about the movie was about Katherine Johnson. And it turns out, I think just in the last year, I think she died. I, I think she did. So that's a very unfortunate, but got to see this movie. Great movie, Hidden Figures. And uh, you will not be disappointed. Do a through, just a paragraph write up was good enough for a few points. So now we're getting ready to do this, to send an astronaut up. But guess what? On April 12th, 1961 in Russia, they beat us with a person. All this stalling, setting up animals, and uh, yeah, Yuri Gagarin, the first person into space and to orbit the Earth. That's good to know. Yuri Gagarin. So, yeah, they beat us. We were not happy. The astronauts were especially not happy. Uh, and Gagarin was a, he was a, na he became a national figure, a parade for him, not here. Man, he didn't have a, yeah, there were no parade for him in the U.S. But, uh, but oh yeah, he was, uh, very, he's very famous in Russia. You can see why. And then there's Gagarin's capsule, where he was in. Now, we decided to, okay, you know what? Enough, enough is enough. Let's send someone up. Send someone up. We gotta, there's still one place where we can beat the Russians, and that's the moon. So maybe we can get people up there. We can send one person up at a time, then maybe a couple people in another mission, and then three people and get to the moon before the Russians. So our first person we sent into space was Alan Shepard. Alan Shepard, the first American human into space, he did not orbit the Earth like Gagarin did. Gagarin was the first person up and orbited the Earth, I think like three times. Shepard just went up. It was like a 15-minute mission. Went up, came right back down, but at least we got a person into space. He became famous. So that was Shepard. Alan Shepard, good person to know. There's his launch of his Mercury Redstone rocket. Enough room for one person in this capsule. I'll see if I can find that clip to show you. There's his capsule. 
Then the third person, now the, uh, Gus Grissom went up after, um, after Shepard, Alan Shepard. And then the first American to orbit Earth was John Glenn. He went up in the third Mercury mission into space. So John Glenn played by Ed Harris in The Right Stuff. And he, very famous, you probably heard of him. He actually went up when he was 75 years old, he got to go up in the space shuttle just to kind of commemorate his, his first, his orbit of the Earth. And here's another rocket they use in the Mercury series, the Mercury Atlas rocket. Some interesting rocket uh, stories or different types of rockets. The first, now the Russian, the first woman into space was actually Russian. So the Russian beat us with a person, the Russians beat us with a woman. Now it doesn't matter whether you're a, you know, a man, woman, child, doesn't matter. And you're, in, I mean, uh, we, we, everybody's working together these days, but this time it was, it was big news. This was 1963. So this is Valentina Tereshkova. And she was the first woman into space. And she's still around. It was pretty, pretty neat. Now, meanwhile, during the mid to late 60s, remember what, the, what our plan was? Well, even though the Russians beat us everywhere else, we still can beat them to the moon. So if we want to get to the moon, we got to get to the moon first before we got to send a person there, people there. We got to get there and see if we can land there. We got to take pictures of the best landing sites. We got to make sure if you lay land there, they don't get sink into some sort of soil, then just kind of get buried. So we sent the ranger uh, there to purposely crash into the moon. The surveyors that landed on the moon, soft landed to test the nature of the surface and the orbiter, lunar orbiter, to orbit the moon to find best locations to put people down. So this was our, it's called the unmanned space program, unmanned. So here's views from Ranger 9, is it before it crashed into the moon? Here's a lunar orbiter first in 1966, 1966 the first photo of Earth from the moon. It's beautiful, there's the moon, a moon, there's a nice crescent Earth. It's kind of, yeah, it's still a crescent. Therefore, hey, what would the moon be from the Earth then? If it's a crescent Earth, the moon should be from, if you're on the Earth, which you are, uh, back, back then, be give us, give us. Project Gemini. Good to know Project Gemini. These were missions that if we were going to go to the moon, we're going to have to go to the moon with three people. So the Mercury missions only had one person go up at a time. Then if we're going to have three people go up, we better have practice with at least two, get up into space, just up into space, maybe orbit. Those are Project Gemini, two person missions. Ed White, first spacewalk. Uh, tethered to uh, his sh the ship, and it's called a spacewalk. If you're tethered uh, with a with a with this uh, cord, with a cable to the ship, and you're out there, it'd be, it'd be quite a quite a view from out there. That would be pretty <laughs> a pretty great thing to do. So that's Ed White. Now the Apollo missions, the Apollo missions. But I'm gonna we're gonna save this for a little bit later because I'm gonna find I'm try to find a video for you to show. So. But this is the one we're going to start with next time. This is the mission that we were going to, the, the missions, many different missions from 1968 to 1972. These were three person missions using what is known as the Saturn V launch vehicle, this rocket. This rocket is absolutely incredible. I mean, I'm going to say it right now, I'm going to say it again. There is nothing that we've built more powerful, um, more, I mean, thrust for a machine than this rocket. And this was in the six, this was, this was 50 years ago. There's still today in the military, no machine that has more power, just sheer power uh, than the energy of this rocket. I mean, this rocket was incredible. And this was used because you had to take three people and supplies up and machines up and just to leave Earth, it's not an easy feat. It's not an easy feat to get out of Earth's atmosphere, especially with something this big. So it had to be intense. So I'll talk about that again, but that's a Saturn V launch vehicle. And we are going to end this. I'm gonna to try to find some videos for you.